friends, Nadia here, and I'm back with an episode that has been bubbling up inside me for so long, and I finally realized that it is the societal patriarchal stigma that shames women into silence, which is what has been holding me back from talking about this, and I'm finally ready to talk about orgasming slash self-pleasure, you know, all of that good stuff. Um, anyways, as you probably know by now, I'm Nadia Okamoto, and you're listening to another episode of Tigris, where we talk about kind of anything. Um, anyways, so on the topic of orgasming or lack thereof, um, I feel like I've had this personal barrier from talking about this ever publicly. And there are a few reasons. One, um, I think even in the last few years as a female founder and you know trying to raise capital from investors and still trying to be a big sister role model to so many young menstruators out there, I myself have felt like talking about sex and orgasming was a big no-no. And that's not just for me internally, but there have been a lot of people who have told me that I should not talk about this, and there are still people who tell me that. Um, And so I'm a little bit nervous because I feel like I am going to shock some people by talking about this. But then over the last few days, as I've been thinking about why I personally feel embarrassed to talk about it, I realize that it's a lot of internalized misogyny that I am still working through. First and foremost, I think that in talking about orgasming, I am nervous because I am admitting that I am sexually active. And by being sexually active, I have this fear of being labeled like a slut, right? And that doesn't come from nowhere. That comes from, you know, growing up in a society that told me that virginity was very much a real thing. And then then when you lose your virginity, it's something that you're teased about. And, you know, being sexually active as a woman means being a slut, like kind of to an extreme versus like, you know, I think a cis man would be kind of congratulated for getting laid and things like that. So, you know, for me, I've spent the last few months answering questions from so many young menstruators and saying like, virginity is a social construct. And I firmly believe that. But it's only in like the last few days where I've really realized like, well, yeah, I personally believe that virginity is a social construct. Yet, why am I so nervous to admit that I am sexually active? And why am I so nervous to admit that I have had a really hard time orgasming, right? Um, Which leads me to my next point, right? Not just the internalized misogyny, but I think for a long time and still today, there's a part of me that feels like I am broken, like my body isn't working the way it should um, because I've had a really hard time you know, you know, kind of reaching that climax, especially on my own, um, which I feel like is the opposite case for a lot of my female friends out there. Um, But I feel like, you know, I have put this pressure on myself that my body is supposed to work a certain way and it's supposed to perform, keyword perform, a certain way. And because it doesn't, my body is not working, right? And I think that that also encapsulates a lot of the maybe body dysmorphia or shame that I've experienced over the last, like, you know, my whole adolescence, right? Um, So, you know, I've mentioned that virginity is a social construct, and this is something that we have talked about on Tigris before. Um, And I think that for me, that's not a realization I came to until like my college academic life when I was taking these women's and gender studies and really learning about the fact that virginity is such a heteronormative concept that was created by the patriarchy to tell primarily young women that they were either pure or impure um, and kind of construct this false sense of value pre-marriage, right? And I think that there's a difference of acknowledging that it's a social construct and that it is a uh, unfair and sexist one to then really, I think, internalizing virginity is a social construct and I should have no kind of embarrassment from talking about the fact that I have been sexually active, right? Of course, there's the flip side of this too, which is just like, oh, sex is still not really talked about by, I think, entrepreneurs who are maybe not in the sexual wellness space. Like, obviously, I am in the period sexual wellness space, so I think I'm surrounded by a lot of people and entrepreneurs who do talk about it. But even then, like, I am still very much on, like, the young entrepreneurship side where I think sex even more so is considered an inappropriate topic, right? Um, And I'm honestly really nervous about talking about this um, 
on an episode because, you know, before I decided to do this, I had messaged my co-founder, Nick, and I said, like, is it okay that I'm starting to talk about, like, vibrators and self-pleasure? And he said, honestly, I don't know, because he's also heard the advice that we've gotten from mentors that I shouldn't talk about this because talking about sex makes me less of a great role model for young menstruators out there. Um, But, you know, I think for me, it's really in the last few days that I was like, okay, I know I need to talk about this because even those young menstruators that I'm supposed to be, you know, uh, maybe a good role model for and not talk about sex, those are the same menstruators who are in my DMs asking me about what it means to use a tampon and lose their virginity, right? And I think what we forget is that middle schoolers today are having sex, they're exploring their own bodies, you know, they're getting their period, they're interacting with their vulvas and anatomy and... I think for me, like there's so much that I wish I would have known going into being sexually active um, earlier that I feel like maybe I can impart on those same young menstruators, right? Uh, And I apologize if I'm stumbling over my words. It's just like I'm really, you know, in this moment working through a lot of that internalized misogyny and shame of feeling like this is not something I should talk about. Um, And like even thinking about the words to use, right? Like orgasm comes, you know, climax seeing like it is a topic that I think you know I've for so long internalized is like not okay to talk about and because I'm talking about it in the context of oh my body doesn't really work in this way I do feel this embarrassment that I'm like currently working through right and I want to be really honest with you about that because you know I really look up to a lot of creators online who I think talk so openly about it and I wish I could just be like that and I feel like for me I'm hoping that I get there one day but to be very honest like I am feeling awkward about this but you know what that's why we talk about all the things on Tigris anyways so let's talk about where my relationship with masturbation started right I think that I think like every little girl, like, and obviously every little boy, like ever, every whatever gender, but whatever genitalia someone has, like at a really young age, even like I think four or five years old, and I started noticing this when I was babysitting in high school, they're realizing that they have these pleasure points, right? Like a lot of the times you see young girls who like sit on a pillow kind of funny, or they sit on like the edge of a table, or they kind of like sit on your lap a little bit funny. And in their minds, it's not like a pleasure thing, right? But they understand that there's a sensation down there that feels really new, right? It's kind of tingly, it's exciting, you kind of like it. um, And there's no part of you that's like, oh, this is, you know, my clitoris, which is causing sexual pleasure, right? It's just like, oh, here's like a kind of like a little button that you're experiencing, right? And I think for me in middle school, I got an uh, an eye touch. I don't know if y'all remember that. Uh, the older Gen Z members, millennials and above, will remember that an eye touch was kind of like pre um, was like a mix between an iPod and an iPhone, right? Where it wasn't a phone, but it kind of looked like a phone, but it was really an iPod, right? It wasn't your phone. It was simply like had internet, and it was really crazy that it had internet, and it had the little iPhone with like the button, right? Old school iPhone, like iTouch was pre-iPhone. And I got one in middle school, and I used to bring it to sleep with me. And uh, at first, I, you know, I would just watch like the free episodes of Wizards of Waverly Place and like The Office. I had one episode of each and I just watched them on repeat. Um, a key point, it was The Office episode called Basketball. Hilarious. Still one of my favorites. Um, anyway, so it had internet. And, you know, this is the time when I started going to middle school and everybody was talking about porn, right? Like suddenly from fifth to sixth grade, like suddenly the boys are watching porn. Suddenly like they're holding me down on the school bus and making me watch porn, which is also a whole different story for another time. But like I was kind of being exposed to this conversation around like, like what sex actually looked like, right? Of course, my mom had given me like the quote unquote talk already. So I knew by definition what sex was, but I didn't really know what it looked like. And I didn't know what I was, what it really meant to see in person or to experience. But this was a conversation that was uh, started to be had by a lot of the people around me. Naturally, as a curious young person, um, lying in bed with insomnia, not being able to go to sleep with an eye touch with internet, um, that's where I started, right? And I think for me, it might, my, my seeking it out purely came from a uh, curiosity um, to understand what it is everybody was talking about. It wasn't from a like, oh, I'm going to masturbate and this is what I want to do. It was simply like, 
what is sex and like what does it feel like and what is the person thinking about and so I actually started on these like erotic personal stories I I honestly I have not looked it up in a long time but I think that there was this website called like sexy dirty stories or like true dirty stories and I remember just reading through these things and like not getting turned on as a middle schooler or anything like that but simply just purely out of curiosity like oh, so, you know, this woman is talking about how she's getting really excited and she's nervous and there's this anticipation. And, you know, of course it talks about his size and like what it looks like. And then I think for me, it wasn't like a, I'm turned on. I think for me, I, and I still have this like fascination about it. Like I'm just so fascinated by, I think the experience of it, right? I wanted to understand like, what is this and what is considered this, you know, scandalous sexy side and what is the, you know, these stories of losing your virginity. And then here's a, you know, a plethora of stories of doing it in places that aren't the bedroom. Like, I think for me, it was very much out of curiosity. And naturally, I think for me, I, of course, start exploring my own body And I think that for me, I always had this like, oh, it feels good, you know, and I'm, it feels a little bit weird, but I've always, and I still today, when it comes to self-pleasure, always have this like fear, like the fear of what's to come. Um, And full disclosure, I've never made myself orgasm. I'm 23 today and I've never made myself orgasm. And for that reason, I like don't really masturbate myself. Right. Um, But that being said, I think even from a middle school age, it didn't mean that it didn't feel good in you. Right. So I think that for me, I started to explore a little bit more, whether it be with pillows or myself. But honestly, I think I spent more time just reading out of curiosity, like not really exploring anything. Um, And I think when a lot of people hear this and they're like, what, how could you not like what's wrong? And to be honest, I think that there is still this traumatized part of me where that sensation of touching down there is reminiscent, um, especially at nighttime of, you know, what I felt when, you know, trigger warning, sexual abuse, like what I felt growing up when I was being touched by my father, like going to sleep, right? And so I think that there's a part of me that always, you know, I labeled an orgasm as kind of this like exciting reward that I didn't want to reach because it was something that wasn't for me, but also that I think that there was this, there's this kind of fear of it. Like I still have it now when I'm like almost there and I just get scared. Like I'm scared that my body's going to crumble. I'm scared that like something's going to explode and I'm kind of scared of what's to come. And you know, I'm still kind of trying to understand it. And sometimes I do get in this headspace of maybe there's something wrong with me. Like there's something wrong with the nerves down there. But I mean, maybe that's by definition what an orgasm is, right? It's this like huge burst of, you know, pleasure and and energy. But for me, like I do genuinely have this like, oh my gosh, like I need to stop, right? This is something that, and it's not like not okay. It's just like I get kind of scared of it and I get kind of nervous. Um, And then I think there's this also you know, mental health sides of side of it, where my mind is just like kind of busy. Like I am thinking about, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the story that I'm reading, you know, in middle school. Um, but I get kind of carried away and like analyzing it like, Oh, but why is that? Isn't that a little bit inappropriate? Like that's kind of disrespectful. Like, doesn't that hurt? Like there's this part of me where I'm always so curious about like overanalyzing it. Um, and then there's, you know, in my own body, like I already, have a hard time being in my body and slowing down and being super present. And I feel like that's why, like, uh, you know, orgasming and self-pleasure is so important for so many people is that it's like the ultimate for you and in your body, which is honestly my biggest challenge, right? Like, you know, on the last episode, we talk about deep, we talked about depersonalization and like, to me, how am I supposed to feel my body if I can't feel my body? And I think even today, like if I try to pleasure myself, I'm like, oh, I'm wondering like what I'm going to do after this. Do I get back to work? Like I have two hours before my next meeting. Maybe I should like pull out my laptop, laptop. I can probably do a little bit more writing or, you know, some more emails. So I feel like even today I'm really working through this element of like not being able to focus in my body. Like I've so, it's that ADHD and depersonalization on a high, right? Where like, I don't have that distraction in front of me. So I'm trying to focus on my body, but because my mental health has told me that self-pleasure is not something I deserve, I don't actually allocate the attention and time and, you know, I think focus into really letting myself feel that. Um, 
I think one of the reasons that I feel excited to do this episode today is that I recently um, finished the audiobook Pleasure Activism, which my friend recommended to me. Um, and I'll have to look up the author, but it, incredible book, like must read book. Um, and it's written by this queer black woman and talks about how pleasuring yourself and orgasming, orgasming and, you know, challenging the boundaries of sex and pleasure, monogamy, relationships, hookup culture, everything like that. It talks about how learning to pleasure yourself for you and by yourself and on your own is like the biggest form of ultimate joy and resistance against systems of oppression, right? And it's this really fascinating take that I don't think I've ever really understood, but I think the more I really, you know, read the book, internalized it, and I actually listened to a few chapters, you know, multiple times, was it was like realizing that a lot of what this author talked about was, you know, explained the internalized misogyny that like I feel inside of me, right? Which is my body is not for myself. Sex is not for me. Sex is for performing something for others to pleasure others. Um, and then maybe I can't talk about this. Maybe I can't explain it. And when I look for healthy examples of sex, right, you know, as a middle schooler, you know, trying to go understand what sex looks like, I end up on a porn hub where I'm seeing vulvas that look unrealistic and bleached and hairless, where it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of rape culture there. There's a lot of like, I think grooming that's, ex you know, shown there. And it's not a uh, empowering, you know, I think also gender inclusive, sexuality inclusive, you know, range of media when you first look it up, right? So I think that, you know, I, I highly recommend this book, Pleasure Activism, but I think that it really highlighted a lot of the things that I am societally working through, but also personally working through. Um, I also think the book, like, and understanding these, you know, societal dynamics that have prevented me from exploring my own body in a way that I want to, also allowed me to forgive myself for not being able to orgasm. It made me to realize, like, okay, it's not my fault. Like, there's not something that's wrong with me. It's, like, something that's wrong with society, but this is something that I can work through, right? Um, you know, I also think that like it's a very recent thing where I've been able to combine my under my like academic understanding that virginity is a social construct to the understanding of I lost my virginity when I was 16. Right. So um, and, and I also think that for a long time I've carried shame when my friends have talked about having sex for the first time or losing their virginity where like I always had to make this excuse that like I didn't count my the sexual assault I experienced um, my freshman year in high school I didn't count that as losing my virginity quote unquote because that was out of my control and that I wanted to identify and like choose the moment where I did right um, and I think it wasn't until I really like came to terms with my pansexual identity that I was like okay fuck virginity like that's a social construct because how, if virginity is about penetration then how do you understand that in the context of you know homosexual relationships so you know I I think that for me it's a recent understanding that like when I was 16 and I had sex and exploration for the first time, that was just me exploring. And I don't have to make it this big moment of changing my quote, like purity or sense of self, you know, at that age. I do think that it was something that I did probably too early from an emotional standpoint, purely because I think as a survivor, there's a part of me where, you know, I found this guy I felt safe with and I wanted to get it out of the way. But I also think that there still was a lot of healing that I needed to do to like really reclaim my own body. But also I think jumping back into being sexually active, like I think for the first five, six years of me being sexually active. So meaning like literally until a couple of years ago, I always faked climaxing and for me, it's because I think I was conditioned and have been conditioned to think of sex as performative, right? Like, it's not for me as the person with, like, the vagina, like, in, in a, especially in, like, penis and vagina sex. Like, it's not for me. It's, like, it's an act, right? And that's maybe something I learned from porn, you know, from middle school. It's, it's something I learned from conversations. It's something I learned from, like, media or seeing sex scenes, like, on TV where... And I also think it's from this internalized shame that like my body doesn't work. Like if I can't make myself climax, then how can I expect someone else to? And maybe that means like, you know, they are, they want me to orgasm. So I need to, right. And so you fake it and you fake it. And I think for me, 
I, I think I also, you know, in the moment always had this nervousness like, oh, they're not going to like me if I don't do this. They're not going to um, be impressed by it, right? Like really thinking of being sexually active as performative. And honestly, that's a lot from my trauma, right? Like I learned that any sort of touching of my body, you know, my trauma response was like, kind of, it was this is not for me. I just need to like pleasure and get it over with. Like if they finish faster, it'll be done. Um, and I think that that's something, you know, I still very much have been working through. Um, um, and I think it's also something that I was always scared to talk about with partners. Like, um, you know, it, I, it's only been, I think maybe since I was 21, like 21 in my last relationship was like the first time I think I really felt like, oh, okay, like maybe that is an orgasm, right? And like kind of experiencing it, but again, never on my own, where I think I finally found myself in situations where I could be really open with a partner that this is sometimes hard for me and like I go into this mode immediately when we start hooking up of like having to perform and sometimes I don't like it but even in that relationship there was a lot of pressure right like there was a lot of instances where I felt like it was my responsibility to you know let myself be used in that way and I didn't always feel respected in that relationship um but I mean, in my relationship today, like it is very pleasurable and I am super open with my partner. And he's also very upfront with me on like, if I'm thinking it, like that's not something he wants at all and he can absolutely read it on me. Um, and I'm not gonna go too into detail because I wanna respect his privacy and boundaries on that too. Um, but you know, I think I wanted to share this because I've been getting so many messages from young menstruators specifically on, you know, what it means to hook up and like, are they losing their virginity if they use a tampon? And I think for me, it's like, it's been a long journey of really trying to internalize that there isn't shame of exploring your own body and having an orgasm as a survivor is really hard. But from the conversations that I've had with other survivors and from also like just different educators I've read, like their re writings about, it's also really healing. And I think that there's there's kind of this 2022 resolution that I'm creating for myself of really exploring my own body and exploring what I like because I don't think I've ever allowed myself the opportunity to explore. And for the first time, I'm talking about it more online. Like I've been messaging more with other female founders who work in the self-pleasure space, you know, who are creating these vibrators and products that are for women by women, right? Um, I also think that there's a lot of healing that I've been doing because even when I hooked up with girls, you know, as before Henry, I was like very much not hooking up with men as much. Like, you know, I think that for me, like, even in those experiences, those are experiences where when I, for the first time, didn't feel like I had to perform as much because it wasn't in that like cis male relationship with a cis male where that's where I think porn really taught me to like perform for them. And that those were instances where I could really kind of even explore my own body and also where I also enjoyed giving pleasure. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a, a big part of me where I feel like I'm a total noob about this like I'm not coming to this podcast talking about oh here's how you embrace your body and give yourself pleasure because I think that I wanted to be forward with y'all and say like I feel still feel awkward about this and I still feel like nervous about what my body can and cannot do I don't have total faith that my body is like able to work in that way um and I envy my friends who you know where masturbation and self-pleasure is a form of like self-care and it's just like something that they always feel really open about and they do it like to relax for me it's like not relaxing to me it's like stressful um but I think that I also am really inspired by a lot of these feminist writers who are talking about how it's like an ultimate form of liberation and joy for yourself and that's something that I also really want to achieve and I think is kind of a big obstacle, big O, big O obstacle um, ahead of me that I want to work through in the new year. Um, anyways, I want to hear what y'all think. I hope this has made sense to y'all. Again, this is my first time really diving into this and talking about it, and I'm nervous to put this out, but, you know, again, Tigress for me is all about just pushing those boundaries and growing through it, growing through the awkwardness, um, and I hope this helps some of y'all out there. Uh, as you know, we're here, out here every Wednesday with a new episode. Um, here Huge thank you to my team and my producers at DCP who have listened to me rant about orgasming for the last 20 minutes. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear what y'all think. Bye, y'all.